So this is what we read. Second Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 11. We read this. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the, the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you once again for your word. May you lead us. May you guide us. <clears throat> may you speak to us, Lord. Amen. As we begin our time together, I want to start with a question. Uh, and this is the question. What kind of life do you desire to live? Quite a big question on a, on a Sunday afternoon. What kind of life do you desire to live? Or perhaps you can put it this way. Uh, think of it as in like a, a statement. So fill in the blank of this statement. I desire to live a blank life. What would you fill in that blank with? So I desire to live a blank life. I want you to have a brief think about that. And I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that while I get some water from my throat. So two minutes. What would you fill that blank with? And feel free to write it down or have a think about it. Can you get me some water? Thanks, right. I hope you have that answer. You don't worry, you don't need to shout it out. It's a rhetorical question, so you can keep it to yourself. But have a think. What would your answer be? Maybe you would say one of the following. I desire to live a productive life. Anybody desire that? Anybody think of that as their thing they wrote down? Or how about I desire to live a meaningful life? A purposeful life. I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to have purpose. Maybe you put down, I desire to live a successful life. An inspiring life. Maybe some of you put, I want to live a long life. Or perhaps some said, I desire to live a comfortable life. 
I desire to live a happy life, a fun life, an enjoyable life. Perhaps you said some of those things. This is a rhetorical question, so you don't need to say if you thought this or not. But how many of us would have filled in the blank with the word godly? I desire to live a godly life. Uh, To live a life, what does that mean, a godly life? Well, to live a godly life is to live a life that pleases God. It is a life both with God, but also guided by God and for God and through God. It is a life that aligns with his heart, with his character, with his nature. It is a life which is set apart unto him. In essence, here's my life, God. It is yours. And I have to ask myself the question, how often am I desiring of and in pursuit of a godly life? So often we're in pursuit of those other things, productivity, success, meaning, and, and some of those things aren't necessarily wrong in and of themselves. But ultimately, God doesn't just want to be a part of your life to get to the other thing. He doesn't want to just be a part of your life to make you more productive. He doesn't just want to be a part of your life to make you more successful or to give you meaning, although he does give us meaning. He can make us successful. He can give us productivity. No, first and foremost, God is not a means to an end, but rather God is the end. And he desires to be not a compartment of your life, but rather to be your whole life. He desires you and me to live a godly life. And that's what I want to encourage us to. You see, Jesus doesn't want to be the add-on in our life. He, He wants to be our life. And as we begin this new book of 2 Peter, we're going to explore this theme of a godly life in Jesus. What does this look like? What does this mean? How do we live this kind of life? And it really all begins with faith. It all begins with faith. Living a godly life begins with faith. Peter, he opens this letter this way. This is 2 Peter 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So before he saw himself as apostle, he saw himself as a servant. And it says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you receive a letter, it drops through the letterbox, hits the ground, you pick it up, and there are a number of questions which automatically go through our minds, right? Which is who, what, when, and why? Who is this letter from? Who, who wrote it, right? Who is it written to? Is it actually written to me or somebody else in the house or has it been delivered to a wrong address? What is the letter about? What is its content and why? Why has it been sent? And these are good questions for us to, I mean, we ask those questions generally when we pick up a letter, but it's good to ask those questions when we come to the letters that we find in the New Testament, of which this is one. Second Peter is a letter. And who is it written by? Well, we find out straight away. <laughs> it's a guy called Simon Peter. This is the disciple of Jesus. The apostle. And he is writing this letter. And the people who he's writing to, we, we don't really find out until later on, in roughly chapter 3, where in essence we find out that he's writing to the same people that he wrote his first letter to. So what we were looking at in 1 Peter, now we get to 2 Peter, he's written to the same group of people. Now if you remember, the group of people he was writing to, they were pilgrims. They were, uh, he describes them as pilgrims, exiles, strangers. They were Christians who were scattered across Asia Minor, what we would know today as modern-day Turkey. So these believers, they were scattered and they were suffering. And Peter writes to them in that first letter. And you remember, he he reminds them, look, your citizenship is not here, it's in heaven. 
And actually, while you're on earth awaiting to see Jesus face to face, you are your exiles, your strangers. This isn't your home. You're waiting for your true home. And now he follows this up with this sequel, with this particular letter. And right in the very beginning, he's reminding them. He is reminding them that their faith is precious. We'll find out uh, next time we, we go through Second Peter that Peter is writing this, and as he's writing this, he's knowing that the end is near. He's knowing that he's coming to the end of his life. He, uh, what we, we don't read in the Bible, but rather what we know from, from just uh, church history and tradition is that uh, si- uh, Peter was uh, executed. He was killed for being a follower of Jesus. And he's nearing the end of his life, and he, he knows, hey, he gets this sense that oh, my, my, my life's going to end. And so... There is very much urgency and passion in this letter because he's like, hey, I'm about to go and I want to make sure you believers are are ready. I want to make sure you believers are in good standing. And so I'm going to spend a lot of my time reminding you because we're so prone to forget. And this is what he reminds them. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He reminds them that A, their faith is precious, and B, it's the same faith that he has. It is a a, a faith of equal standing. I want to encourage you, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is the faith that Peter is talking about. This faith is precious. Do not devalue the faith that you have in Jesus Christ because it is so precious. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, he says this. He tells us too that faith is precious. And is it not precious? For it deals with precious things, with precious promises, with precious blood, with precious redemption, with all the preciousness of the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, our faith is precious because of the result of our faith is forgiveness and salvation. That's a precious gift. Being reconciled to God, there is no gift greater than that. That's precious. But then the means by which God brought that about was precious. Why? Because it resulted, it it needed the, the death of God's very own Son, Jesus Christ. Nobody more precious. So the result of our faith is precious. The means by which we have faith is precious. And as it says here, for with us by the righteousness of our God. This is the good news of the gospel, that we are saved and that we are forgiven, not because of our righteousness but because of God's righteousness because in fact we were unrighteous people but he was a righteous God and so he dies in our place so that we could be forgiven and so that by faith we could be made right with God righteous this is good news and so he continues on He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful kind of opening statement, right? An encouragement. I pray that grace and peace would increase for you. Uh, Basically, in essence, you could could put it this way, right? In essence, he's saying this. As you grow in the knowledge of Jesus, as you know him more, May his grace and his peace to you increase more and more and more. What a beautiful, beautiful statement and prayer. And then that leads us on to this. 
So faith is the basis, the starting point for us living a godly life. And then we read this where Peter gives us all that we need to live such a life. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Now let me read that again, because that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Let me read the bit just before. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power, so speaking of Jesus, as his divine power has given to us, so us as Christians, all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. But how? Through the knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by glory and virtue. You see, Jesus has divine power. The reason why he has divine power is because he is God himself. Peter mentioned at the beginning, he said, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus has divine power. He has theos uh, dunamis, in essence, godly, explosive power. And while Jesus was ministering on earth, right, we saw that power in action. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He walked on water. He calmed storms. He opened the eyes of the blind. He made the lame to walk. He predicted the future. And above all those things... He himself rose again from the dead. We looked 2,000 years ago at these eyewitness accounts and we're like, wow, we can clearly see Jesus' divine power in action. But I want to encourage you, his divine power is at work today towards you and towards me. And this is where we see it. As his divine power, so his divine power is still at work today. And what is it doing? It is giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All that we need for life and godliness is found in Jesus. And he has provided it for us. Isn't that an incredible Perhaps another way you could say it this way is this, all that we need to live a godly life has been given to us by the power of Jesus. Let us take a moment to marvel at this statement. Because perhaps there are moments where you're like, Lord, I don't know how I can live this life that you're calling me to live. And, and here we read this, oh, actually, he's giving you everything you need to live this life. Through his power, he's given you everything you need. And how do we experience this? It says this, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Think of it this way. It's like this. So, so Jesus calls us to him. And when we accept that call, when we put our faith in him, his divine power is there to enable us to live life and godliness. So how does he work this out? In essence, how, what are these all things that pertain to life and godliness? Well, let me give you a few of these things that God gives us in order to live godly lives and actually, it's really just going to, the main bulk of it, although there are other things, the main bulk of it is really going to center around himself. God has given us himself. And because he's given him, us himself, in essence, that's the all things that pertain to life and godliness is him. And let me kind of give you an example. Let me kind of break it down, right? Let's look at the, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has given him himself. So through Jesus dying on the cross 
and rising again, you and I, first and foremost, can be forgiven for all the times we fail to live godly lives. He forgives us. But not only does he forgive us, his grace is there to forgive us when we fall, but his grace is there to then change us. It says that when you put your trust in Jesus, you become a new creation. You receive a new heart that now actually desires to want to do that which pleases God, right? He's giving you what you need, what pertains to life and godliness. So for giving himself, you can be forgiven and given a new heart. Then in relation to that, through him giving the Holy Spirit, God living inside of you, he then empowers you to live a new life. Please, if you take anything away from our time today, you cannot live a godly life in your own strength. You cannot live this life that God calls you to on your own, in your own power, in your own strength, or in your own determination. The only way you can live this life is through him empowering you it is through him enabling you that is the only way and he's given you what you need for that he's given you the holy spirit and so we come to jesus we say jesus jesus holy spirit please help me live out this life empower me to live this life for you he's also given us a reconciled relationship to the father we can call upon God the Father at any point and at any time. We can talk with him. We can pray to him. We can experience his help. He's also given us the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is breathed out from God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he's given you the Son, he's given you the Spirit, he's given you the Father, he's given you his word. And as you read his word, as you come under his word, as you follow and obey his word, you will see life and godliness flowing out. And then he's also given us the church. He's given us the body of Christ. He's given us each other. How many, and we've kind of touched on it the last few, uh, uh, um, when we're going through First Peter, but how many commands in the New Testament do we see these one another commands? One another, one another, one another. Time and time again, these instructions, one another, one another. In essence, it's you as Christians do this with each other. You see, he has given us the Son, the Spirit, the Father, the Word, his body, the church, and fellowship to enable us to live the life that he has called us to. So I want to encourage us. We have all that we need for life and godliness, and it is found first and foremost in God, the Son, Spirit, and Father. It is found in his Word. And as we do life together in fellowship as the body of Christ. God provides all we need to live godly lives. And the means for a godly life is believing promises. A lot of this comes down to us trusting in the promises that God has made to us. It says this, by which have been given to us exceedingly and precious, so exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in, in the world through lust. God, by his glory, so that's his, his magnificence, by his virtue, that's his excellence, he has called you and has also given you promises. And these promises are exceedingly great 
and they are precious promises. As we go through the word of God, we, we find promises that God has made to us. And part of me was wanting to maybe just go through some of them, but then I was like, well, there were just so many, I didn't know where to begin. And perhaps we should maybe do that as an exercise one day, is just write out all the promises that God has made to us. But what we see is, it is through these promises, we partake of God's divine nature. What does that mean? Well, as we believe and trust in the promises that God has made to us, in essence, we, we begin to become more like him. I mean, for example, right? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So there is a promise that if you believe in Jesus, you will have everlasting life. When we believe that promise, when we accept that promise and put our faith in him, we then begin to partake of who he is. In essence, we become his children. And it is through these promises that we then escape the corruption that is in the world around us. We don't need to look far to see corruption in the world. It takes on its various guises, its various forms, but I'm pretty sure if I ask you to bring to mind ideas of corruption, we could all bring it to mind. And often, we, we often think of people in government or in politicians. Uh, I was um, at work uh, earlier this week, um, uh, and I uh, uh, had a friend who uh, is from a particular country, I won't say what country, but um, from a particular country, and uh, was talking about the corruption in there. And in essence, he was talking about how the leaders, they're so concerned about how, in essence, how much they get, how much money that they can receive, that they neglect their roles as leaders to care for the people. So you, you can, you, and we, we see examples of that, right, where, there is where corruption arises. And, and basically, the reason corruption arises is, is because of lust. Often when we think of lust, that word lust, we often associate it with sexual sin. And, and yes, with sexual sin, lust does play a part. But lust really, in its most basic sense, it, it kind of goes beyond that category. Because lust basically is simply desire or longing for that which is wrong or forbidden. Lust is basically sinful desire. Because of man's sinful desire, the world is corrupt. Now that is true in leadership and for politicians, but corruption is much closer to home, is it not? Corruption is not just a thing, a problem which is out there. Corruption is a problem which is in here. We are guilty of having a corrupted heart, guided just by our own sinful desires, where we are governed by what we want and when we want. And so we make choices governed by that. That's corruption. And it affects us personally. It affects the relationships that we have with others. But the way in which we escape that corruption is through the exceedingly great and precious promises of Jesus. When we come to the word of God and we see his promises, with the foundation of that being the promise of salvation, when we grab onto that promise, when we accept that promise, he leads us out. He causes us to escape from the corruption that is in us and even around us. So I want to encourage us, hold on to the promises. Hold on to the promises of God. Because as we do so, as we hold on to his promises, as we trust in his promises, as we believe in his promises, we will see that our godly life will follow from that. And then it leads us to this in what he says in verse Five, because in some ways, this is what a godly life looks like. 
And he calls us to pursue it with diligence, in essence, to go after it. Um, so let me read this and then we'll unpack it a little bit, okay? So verse 5 to 7, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. What I love about this is that list of things that we just read. In essence, this is what a godly life looks like. In essence, because of the great life-changing promises of God, this is how we should respond. We should seek to pursue these things, to add these things to our faith. In essence, to supplement our faith with them. So our faith is the foundation. That's where it begins. It begins with faith in Jesus. But then genuine faith leads to genuine change. If we truly trust God, if we truly believe the promises, we should have this desire to pursue these things and we should see us growing in these things. As Christians, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should be growing in these areas because God desires to have these and to abandon them. And so he makes seven things, right? There's virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and brother, sorry, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. So maybe as a little homework this week, try and memorize that list. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godly, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And obviously, actually, put faith before that as well, because that's where it starts. Faith, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. I'm going to test you next week. So remember, we'll do a little test. Can you remember all of those things? But this is where he says, hey, diligently seek these things. He says, take these things and add them to your faith. Supplement your faith with them. In essence, these are things that we should be in pursuit of. And what you'll see, in essence, these things, often it's, it's heart character that leads to action. So virtue, what does it mean to be virtue, uh, virtuous? Well, basically virtue, it is a, a behavior showing moral standards. In essence, you could call it moral excellence. A kind of the, the Greek words used, uh, what I quite like is it can be translated as valor. Uh, in essence, think of something which is like morally excellent, uh, something which is upright and good and and is often seen when others would seek to not act in such a way so pursue moral excellence and interestingly enough this word virtue we saw earlier on which peter used to describe as of god god is virtue he's morally excellent seek to add moral excellence the next thing we see is knowledge now who is the you know like who is well let me put it this way god's not against us knowing things actually he wants us to know things and actually the bible says that the the source of all knowledge is god himself he's the best place to go for knowledge So go to him. God, help me to know you more. Help me to understand myself more. Help me to understand the world around me more. Let us seek to add knowledge, to grow in knowledge. And and, and there there is an, an active part to that, right? In order for us to grow to knowledge, we have to actively seek out and go, Lord, help me. Lord, show me. And ultimately, we need to pick up the Word of God. For this is where we find knowledge. So seek knowledge. And then the next one he says is this, add self-control. What does it mean to have self-control? It means to, to have control of oneself, uh, morally speaking. 
right? So uh, from a moral point of view, to have a control of yourself. It means that you're not driven or guided by, by feelings, by desires, which at times can be sinful, but rather you're controlled by the truth of God and the truth of his word. As you look at your life, is it a life which demonstrates self-control? Or, or, or is it the opposite? Are you being controlled by something, right? In essence, right, is, is there self-control or are you being controlled and governed by something else? So by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us seek to live lives of self-control. And the next one is this, perseverance. The Greek word here can be translated as enduring patiently or a cheerful or hopeful endurance. Perseverance. This keep to keep on pressing on. Now, now, first and foremost, this perseverance is to be in our faith, in our trust in Jesus, to continue to persevere and to endure despite the challenges and despite the difficulties. Uh, if you think back to the parable of the sower, which Jesus tells, and he tells about a farmer who scatters a seed, and they fall upon, you could say, maybe different soil types in essence. They fall upon different ground, and this different ground is representative of people's different hearts and how they respond to God and his word. And it's interesting because it says this, he who received the seed on s- stony places... This is he who hears the word and immediately it receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So in our faith, in in living this godly life, what does a godly life look like? It looks like persevering persevering in our faith with Jesus, first and foremost. And obviously that then has an effect in, in other aspects of life. You know, we do have to question ourselves. If, if, if every time something difficult comes, we just run away and give up, we need to reflect on our hearts and be like, hey, Lord, is this right? It invokes the kind of imagery, and we see used elsewhere, of a runner, an athlete, or or a soldier. Um, Perhaps you've seen uh, these images, and if you uh, get a chance to um, maybe kind of to to Google it, um, do have a look. Um, There was an athlete, um, a guy called uh, Derek Redmond. And in the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona, uh, he was uh, running the 400 meters uh, semi-final. Uh, and as he was running, he, he pulled his hamstring halfway through the race. I mean, and that's pretty much it. When you do an injury like that, like, you can't run anymore. That's it. But what is amazing is when you, when you watch the footage of this, he, he tears his hamstring halfway through the 400 meters race, and yet he still continues to walk around the track to get to the finish line. I mean, the race is over. He's obviously going to come last. He's not got anything to really win or to prove, but you have this beautiful uh, footage of him going like, no, I am determined to finish this race. And so he's limping with this torn hamstring and his father actually gets onto the track and then puts his arm around him and helps him to finish, helps him to complete a full lap to a standing ovation. That is an example of persevering. It's an example of, ah, man, I've I've pulled my hamstring. What am I going to do? And yet he continues on. And that's what Jesus desires for us in our faith in our walk with him, when we pull the hamstring, when we face the difficulty, a godly life is one that continues that 
perseveres through the difficulty. He then says to add godliness. Uh, godliness, in essence, is, is holiness. Remember what we looked at a few uh, a couple months ago when, when, when God says, be holy for I am holy. In essence, it's like, hey, seek to emulate Jesus in his character, in his love, in his nature. Godliness is becoming more like God. It is growing in holiness. And then we have this brotherly kindness. Uh, this word uh, uh, can basically, basically mean uh, it's love of the brethren or brotherly love. In, es- in essence, invokes an image of, of two brothers. Now, this, this image <laughs> is perhaps harder for some to imagine than others because if you have a bad relationship with your brother, this is quite hard to. It's like, brotherly love? I've not experienced that. But I want you to kind of envision whether you've experienced it yourself or not, but I want you to envision when you've seen a brotherly relationship, like a solid, a fruitful, a, uh, a healthy relationship between two brothers, when they're there for each other, thick and thin, where they encourage each other, where they walk through difficulty with each other. This is a kind of image that is being invoked here. Have a brotherly kindness towards one another and then we get to this number seven which is arguably the most important and add to brotherly kindness love what does a godly life look like a godly life is one that is marked by love 1 Corinthians 3, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Arguably, this is the most important defining marker of a godly life. It is love. We could be tempted to think, oh, that person's godly because they can speak in tongues. But if they do not have love, they are lacking. They are like a clanging cymbal. Or maybe they're able, maybe they have all this biblical knowledge and I mean they prophesy. I mean, he must be a godly guy. But if he doesn't have love, he's lacking. He is nothing. But what about this guy? I mean, this guy, he speaks to this mountain and it moves. Oh, that dude, he, he, he must be, he's, a, he's a man of God, he's a godly man. But if he has not love, nothing. But what about this guy? He's, he's feeding the poor. If he doesn't have love, it's nothing. Or well, what about this guy, Dan? Come on, it's got to be this guy's a godly guy. I mean, he's, he's willing to mar- be martyred, willing to lay down his life. If he doesn't have love, he is nothing it profits him nothing the most defining marker of godliness and a godly life is love it is love for god and love for others and so peter says add these things to your faith and i want to encourage us we (laughs) Pursue these things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because then he gives a promise in verse 8. He says this, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are abounding in these things, you're, you, there will be fruit. There will be flourishing. 
There will be spiritual life if you are in, abounding in those things. That's a beautiful promise, right? And maybe we can at times reflect on our lives and be like, hey, Lord, are these aspects in my life? And if they're not, then I come to you and say, God, forgive me, change me, put these things in my life. But here's the promise. If these are things are abounding, you're going to be fruitful. You're going to bring life. But then he says this in verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. As Christians, if these seven things are lacking in our walk with Jesus, we are short-sighted. And actually even to the point of blindness. If these things are not in our life, we're blind. And, and, And he says this, and this is what you've forgotten. You've forgotten that you were cleansed from your old sins. You have been cleansed from the old way of life to now pursue and live this new life, which is marked by faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And if you are neglecting those things, in essence, you're just running back to your old way of sinning, your old life. And he says, hey, don't do that. Don't forget, you were cleansed from that stuff so that you could live this new life. So live it. Pursue it. Run after it. This is what a godly life looks like. And he says this, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Wow! That's an amazing promise, isn't it? If you do these things, you will never stumble. What does he mean by that? Well, basically this. I can almost guarantee you that the times in which we fall into sin is often down to we're lacking in one of those areas. Right? Go back to it again, right? It's when we find ourselves in sin, it's often because we are lacking in one of those areas. Maybe it's we're lacking to love God and to love others. Maybe it's we're lacking to actually endure and to persevere We're lacking in showing kindness. We're lacking in self-control. We're we're lacking in knowledge. We're lacking in seeking more excellence. You see, when those aspects of a godly life are not abounding, we shouldn't be surprised if we find ourselves just, just living in sin and running back to sin. But if those things are abounding, we're going to find ourselves walking by the grace of God and not stumbling. Yes, we as Christians will never be perfect on this earth. We will reach perfection when we see Jesus face to face. And I look forward to that day when I don't have to wrestle with sin anymore. But today, sin is a wrestle. It is a struggle. But as we pursue this godly life, by the power and by all the things that God has given us to live this life, and as we hold on to and believe the promises, we're going to actually find that we're actually beginning to walk where we used to stumble. That I want you to, when we look at our Christian faith, that's also a healthy marker is, okay, where was I in the past, but where am I in comparison now? Is there a change? Is there a trajectory of, you know what, I still wrestle with this thing, but I don't wrestle with it like I used to. I mean, before I knew Jesus, it wasn't a wrestle. I just did it. But now it's a wrestle. Good. Let's keep keep moving forward. You're on the right trajectory. Or maybe it's a case of, man, I used to struggle with this every week, but now it's like once a year. Praise the Lord for that. Let's keep moving in that trajectory. Keep moving forward step by step. 
If we pursue these things, we're going to be fruitful. We're going to overcome sin in our lives. And then he says this in verse 11, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be very, 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 very clear as we read in Ephesians. And let me just read it to you. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I want to be very clear. That list of seven things, it is not our perfect completion of them that makes us right with God. I want to be so clear. You see, what enables us to enter into the kingdom of God is faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. But I also want to encourage you that real faith leads to genuine change. In essence, if we can't see any virtue, any self-control, any knowledge, any perseverance, any brotherly kindness, any love, if, if all those things are completely absent from our lives, we have to question, do I really believe in this Jesus? Because real faith leads to real change, and those things, in essence, they are fruit of the genuine faith. And that's why it says, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not, okay, if you do these seven things perfectly, you're going to enter into the kingdom. But rather, through faith, that results and bears fruit of these things, that's a sign of genuine faith. And genuine faith leads you into God's everlasting kingdom. So as we go to prayer, I want us to think about those things. Remember, we've, in essence, we thought about that very question at the beginning. What do I desire to live a blank life? And I pray that as we've gone through today, that we could fill in the blank with godly. I desire to live a godly life. And the way in which we got, live a godly life, firstly, the foundation has to be faith. It's a faith in Jesus Christ. It's then we realize the good news that he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness by his divine power. He has given us everything that we need to live this godly life. Let that encourage you and let's go for it. Not in our own strength, but in his strength. It is only through him that we can live this kind of godly life. And what does it look like? It looks like this. It looks like a life which is defined by faith, defined by virtue, by knowledge, by self-control, by perseverance, by godliness, by brotherly kindness, and most important of all, by love. Is, do you see fruit of that in your life? And if not, fall on the knees, come before Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, help me to grow in these areas. Help me by your Spirit to grow and to live the godly life that you have called me to.